Namaste and greetings. I, Harsha Quatra, researcher at INPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to INPRI Web Policy Learning. Today, we are gathered here for day one of feminist foreign policy in the Asia-Pacific region, an online international workshop program, a two-day immersive online discussion workshop. This program is organized by the IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies, CIRSS IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. Before we dwell into the program, let's take a moment to reflect on why feminist foreign policy is not just relevant, but crucial in today's world, particularly in the diverse and dynamic landscape of the Asia-Pacific. According to the International Center for Research on Women, feminist foreign policy is the policy of a state that defines its interactions with other states and movements in a manner that prioritizes gender equality and enshrines the human rights of women and other historically marginalized groups, allocates significant resources to achieve that vision, and seeks through its implementation to disrupt patriarchal and male-dominated power structures across all of its levels of influence, aid, trade, defense, and diplomacy informed by the voices of feminist activists, groups, and movements. It recognizes that gender-sensitive policies contribute to more sustainable peace and security, addressing issues such as conflict pre prevention and post-conflict reconstruction. In the post-colonial context, there's an urgent need to strengthen the spirit of networking and learning from each other's best practices and respect for diversity, plurality, and inclusivity that have been a hallmark for South Asian, Southeast Asian, East Asian, Central Asian countries, and Fiji Islands. The aim of the online workshop on feminist foreign policy in the Asia-Pacific region is to foster a deeper understanding of feminist foreign policy principles, their relevance, and their potential impact on shaping international relations in the Asia-Pacific region. We have gathered a distinguished panel of experts who will share their insights and experiences on this crucial topic. The chair for the program is Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting distinguished professor at MP. The distinguished experts include Ms. Farida Akhtar, Executive Director, UBING, Policy Research for Development Alternative, and President Nargi. Nargitha Prabhatana, Bangladesh, Ms. Lavanya Shumbo Karwan, Assistant Professor, Center for Disasters and Development, G. Tata School of Disaster Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, Ms. Preeti Daruka, Founder and Global Coordinator, BRICS Feminist Watch, Ms. Irina Santiago, Peace Advisor, Local Government Academy, Philippines, Chair Emrita, Wum. Chair Imrita and former CEO, Mindiano Commission on Women, MCW, lead convener, Women Seriously.com, feminist and peace negotiator, Dr. Vahida Nainar, independent researcher, gender and human rights consultant, and Dr. At Atka Noor Alami, head of research, Center for Politics, Badan Risid, Dan Inovoisi, National Brin, Jakarta. Indonesia. The conveners for this course are Dr. Semi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at MT, and Dr. Arjun Kumar, Director at MT. I welcome you all to this enlightening deliberation and thank you for putting your time, energy, and efforts into truly understanding the vital role and complex intricacies of feminism and foreign policy frameworks. Before we start today's session, I would like to announce the housekeeping rules. It is imperative that you join the meeting on time. There will be a Q&A session after each presentation. Share your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. The questions must not be posted as an anonymous attendee. Ensure that your questions are precise. Refrain from making general comments in the question to save time. It is my honor to invite Dr. Simi Mehta for her remarks on the insightful session followed by a book release named Advocating Feminist Foreign Policy for India. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Harsha, and good evening to everyone. It is indeed a delight and a great joy to be witnessing this day. This is a very special day as we are releasing one of the most pioneering works in the field of international relations which is also a relatively lesser studied field uh, in India. A book which is titled Advocating a Feminist Foreign Policy in India, which is co-authored by Honorable Professor Vibhuti Patel, Satyam Tripathi and myself, published by Impri Books. 
having specialized in foreign policy as my area of study with gender justice as an area of interest and research, it is actually very overwhelming to see an amalgamation of both in the form of the work of feminist foreign policy. So right at the outset, I'd like to thank all my co-authors and the research team for having had the patience to work on this topic and espouse their brilliant analysis, contextualizing the unique position which India is at of breaking the adages of being a land of snake charmers to a nation, to a civilization, which is united to carve a space of its own at the, at the global platform and leaving behind a legacy for all the other nations to follow. Um, the topic for feminist foreign policy has been discussed at international and global other platforms um, for quite some time, and it has significantly been gaining some traction and recognition in India. And uh, as um, we'll see, uh, and we'll be discussing more about what feminist foreign policy is, it actually is to define just in the beginning that it is an approach to international relations and diplomacy that seeks to promote gender equality and women's rights as central objectives of a country's foreign policy agenda. So given the stage of development that India is in, and the exciting possibilities that the future holds. I think, and we firmly believe and advocate in the book, is that the time is ripe for women-led development with priority, with, by prioritizing inclusive sustainability. And um, uh, it is great to know that um, Women's Reservation Bill is finally seemingly becoming an act, and uh, therefore proactive discussions on for feminist foreign policy, specially customized for India with a global outlook, will not only address the complex and interconnected challenges related to gender inequality, but it would also contribute to a more just, peaceful and sustainable world order. And uh, this work, this book, which is being released today under the noble guidance of uh, one of India's most eminent feminist feminists, Professor Vibhuti Patel, Satyam and I um, would like to congratulate uh, all of us and also our publisher, thank you, uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, director of IMPRI for uh, facilitating this book. I exhort each one of you as we will be witnessing the book release and we'll also be witnessing very important discussions that will be follow that will follow. I exhort each one of you and those who will be also reading the book to shed your inhibitions and join hands for carving an equal and gender just family, society, nation and the world. So with this, I would like to thank you and I would like to invite my co-author Satyam for, for his presentation. Thank you very much. And I welcome you all to the session. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening to everyone in this esteemed gathering. To start with, first I would like to introduce the three women stalwarts portrayed on the cover to whom this book is dedicated. First is Sri Vijayalakshmi Panditji. She, she was not just the first woman cabinet minister. She also represented India after its independence at the UN and later went on to become the first woman president of the UN General Assembly. Second on the cover is the portrayal of Sri Hansha Mehtaji. She played a significant role as India's delegate to United Nations Commission on Human Rights from 1947 to 1952, wherein she advocated for the gender neutral phrasing of the Declaration of Human Rights by insisting on replacing all men with a more inclusive wording that is all human beings are born free and equal. Third picture is of Sri Koyanara Beliapa Muthamma she was the first woman to clear the India's coveted civil services examination, thereby becoming the first IFS officer. Now coming to the book, this book is an effort to make a legitimate case for India so as to conceive feminism and gender sensitivity beyond the debate of words and deeds, which themselves have become somewhat incongruous, partly because of standardization and also due to the skepticism associated with the semantic relations of feminism itself. Today, there is an apparent lacune in gender dimensions of strategic thinking. Therefore, to, the, to set the record straight, explicitness at the policy level becomes necessary more than ever. Having said that, the book contains four chapters. The first chapter elucidates the background of feminist foreign policy, the concept itself, its origin, and the trajectories of the implementation of FFP around the globe. Furthermore, it also talks about the need for gender sensitive approach in foreign policy, the second chapter contextualizes FFP in Indian setting, where we have tried to align FFP with India's national interests and how it holds relevance for India 
to advance its foreign policy objectives. The third chapter tries to follow up with the contemporary and emerging debates pertaining to women and foreign policy, such as the role of women in diplomacy, gender peace and security, as well as climate change, etc. It also contains the intellectual outcomes of the IMPRI events, which are an online monsoon school program on feminist foreign policy, praxis for a peaceful and gender just world order that took place in the month of September last year and consequently followed by the other physical event at the India Habitat Center, New Delhi. On the theme, Feminist Foreign Policy, Exploring India's Position, which was held in the month of October 2022. Taking cues from other countries' experiences, Chapter 3 also highlights the gaps in FFP and puts forth the tracking mechanisms for implementing the same in India. The conclusion followed by the way forward promises optimism and calls for international relations experts to assess socio-cultural, economic, and political issues from an intersectional gendered perspective, which will ensure a deeper appreciation for the gender differential impact of and responses to the existing as well as unfolding realities. Last but not the least, we would like to acknowledge esteemed panelists, expert resource persons, and all the participants who have been part of the past IMPRI events on this issue. We would also like to thank Dr. Arjun Kumar for facilitating the production of the literature on this pressing issue. And finally, acknowledging and thanking the research team comprising Samriddhi Sharma, Ishina Das, Manusha, and Fiza Mahajan for their time and efforts in materializing this book. With this, I would like to stop now and turn it over to Vibhuti Ma'am and Simi Ma'am. Thank you, Satyam. And uh, I would now like to invite, thank you, Satyam, for providing such a um, brief, wonderful overview of the book. And now I'd like to invite Professor Vibhuti Patel for her inaugural address. Professor, over to you. Ma'am, please unmute. Ma'am, please unmute. Ma'am, please unmute. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Simi Mehta, and Dr. thank you, Satyam, for <laughs> Uh, or for introducing the book, I would like to announce that it is freely downloadable. There is no cost of the book. Anybody can download it. Uh, link is also shared. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the IMPRI team, Dr. Arjun Kumar, Dr. Simi Mehta, Dr. Satyam Tripathi, uh, Mr. Harsha Kavatra for putting this whole uh, two-day workshop uh, together. I know more than 500 people have uh, uh, um, joined the platform and they are from Asia and Pacific region. Some of the stalwarts who have been uh, extremely active for past uh, nearly 50 years, right from the time of before the Towards Equality Report, Professor Pam Rajput is with us. She has been to more than 85 countries over this year discussing the global feminist solidarity and some of the important issues on, on uh, women. She played an important role even in the Beijing platform for action. Dr. Shivli Kumar from TISS, Dr. Shanta Shrestha from Nepal, Beyond the Beijing Committee. Uh, they are there along with so many young scholars, journalists, uh, students, research uh, scholars, teachers, and uh, also the political activists are here with us. I welcome Ms. Parida Akhtar, my long-standing co-traveler in the feminist movement, Ms. Preeti Daruka, who is playing a very important role in BRICS. Uh, discourses, Professor Lavanya Shanbag Arvin, who is in the School of Disaster Management of TISS. And also tomorrow's panelists, I think Ms. Irene, Irene Santiago, uh, Ms. Atika Noor Alami, and Dr. Vahida Nainar, who have actually participated in the global diplomatic discourses. They have been in the part of the International Criminal Court, and they have also take, uh, brought out the important concerns of women and peace and also gender-based violence on a global platform. Again, organized UNHRC into action on some of the vital issues of, uh, which were like a, of global concern and also the concerns in Asia Pacific region. Now this uh, online uh, international workshop on feminist forest, uh, foreign policy in Asia and Pacific was envisaged after our last year's excellent response, more than 80, 800 participants had joined and we had focused on feminist foreign policy in India, uh, and uh, 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 because India is not using that term, they use the term called gender equality. And uh, what were the experiences of other countries? So we had participants, like around 12 resource persons were there from all over the globe. But this time we decided to focus on Asia Pacific region and with the thematic concern of climate change in Asia and Pacific region. Now, genesis of feminist foreign policy 
the uh, is in the uh, transnational feminist solidarity of the 80s and 90s in which international feminist movements supported local women led struggles against devastating impact of radiation due to nuclear testing in past pacific islands release of of mercury pollutants in the sea by Minamata company in Japan, destruction of human life and reproductive health uh, uh, hazards due to Bhopal gas tragedy, Chernobyl nuclear disaster, destruction of rainforest and uh, pollution of uh, Amazon River. We all have been part of this global transnational solidarities uh, as feminists. The famous feminist slogan, think globally, act locally, crystallize the spirit of solidarity, transcending territorial boundaries. For transformative change, they had to address political leaders, diplomats, uh, global public intellectuals, and the United Nations system. Transnational feminist networks such as Development Alternatives with Women of, uh, for a New Era, dawn in uh, 1985, end of the uh, decade conference in Nairobi, or a regional initiative by Madam uh, Miss Irene Santiago, who later on became also the uh, uh, coordinator for Asia Pacific region for the UN women at that time. Uh, Asian Women's Research and Action Network, Avran, uh, they played a pivotal role during the decades for bringing women from different countries and feminists from different countries on a, a, a same platform and exchange the important concerns. And they mobilized not only that to bring attention to or mitigate the uh, negative impact of neoliberal uh, global capitalism on women, but also to construct an alternative vision of global economy uh, that is uh, conducive to women all over the world. Women Environment and Development Organization, we do, which focuses on environmental health and biosafety that provided platform to eco-feminist leaders such as Vandana Shiva, Maria Mies, Vangari Mathai from Africa who started Green Belt Movement. And they could also influence United Nations to come up with path-breaking document on gender and climate change. Because when the in the year 2000, when the first document was put forward by UNFPA on climate change, there was no, there were no word called women in that no and then there was a lot of global outcry by the feminist movement and the whole gender lens was brought in in this new document climate change was the first framed as a problem exclusive to nature uh, natural science due to efforts of environmental movement the focus on role of human behavior in climate change has gained ground and with this an increased understanding of significant gendered consequences of climate change uh, they have also come to the fore. There is an urgency for inclusion of women as policymakers in climate issues. I think that was de debated even in G20 uh, you know, debates. But there is also an urgency that feminist foreign policy take the gendered aspects of climate change into account uh, wherever the policy has been accept, uh, adopted by the around 16 countries have adopted that policy. In the trade agreements, in the aid policies, in a choice of technologies, interventions to mitigate harmful impact of climate change. I think these are very important concerns. And in this webinar, the panel of experts will show us how the feminist policy, uh, because there is also an argument that it's a colonial, uh, neocolonial baggage, or uh, the, it is the agenda of the Western feminists, uh, and uh, uh, what what can be the post-colonial or decolonized way of looking at the uh, relationships between uh, nation states uh, and north-south uh, relationships when it comes to climate change, uh, who uh, bears the burden of climate crisis and who is responsible uh, for, for creating this climate crisis. These are a very, very important debates in which the scientific community, politicians, social activists, and the, uh, the professional bodies, they are very much involved. It's a very live issue. Even the children, this is the first issue in which you see the school children being so articulate and vociferous and proactive. Uh, so the, these issues, need to be addressed with the intersect you know, with keeping into uh, consideration intersectional perspective and the intersectional vulnerabilities of geographic location class ethnicity age disability and gender and i think i'm so happy that today we have these three experts uh miss farid akhtar a veteran feminist miss priti daruka who has very specialized knowledge on the question of uh, foreign policies and Professor Lavanya Shanbo from uh, who, who has been uh, working on the question of disaster management. Uh, they are with us. So thank you very much uh, for and the MP team. Please take over. 
thank you ma'am for those opening remarks um, i would uh, request uh, our esteemed audience to go through the book and uh, the link for the same would be also shared in your emails um now i would like to invite lavanya ma'am uh, and uh, start uh, the theme of today's uh, session is feminist foreign policy in the asia pacific region with regards to climate change over to you ma'am uh, thank you very much uh, a special uh, mention and thanks to the impre team for having me here and uh, dr arjun kumar dr semi mehta thanks for the uh, opportunity and always uh, my gratitude to professor vibhuti patel uh, for thinking of me in Uh, for to, to to speak on such uh, topics, it's um it's an area that uh, I very much uh, am like to be a part of the discourse in whatever small way. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, share my screen. Is I hope my slides are visible, and I hope I'm audible as well. Working yes. mode, make it a slideshow mode. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Yeah, sure, definitely. Uh, so uh. very good uh, evening uh, to all our uh, esteemed panelists to the chair and uh, to the uh, audience who have uh, here with us today i'm lavanya i'm from the uh, school of disaster studies tata institute of social sciences and uh, i'm going to be uh, speaking about uh, climate change impacts and implications while talking in the context of feminist foreign policy and Uh, uh the tone has been rightly set and we have a excellent book and a resource that has been uh, released as well we want to talk about how the foreign policy can transform the ways in which nations engage how we can foster global multilateral cooperation collaboration diplomacy and dialogue and also by addressing the interconnectedness of environment society uh, and advocate for sustainability and equitable solutions which are gender just so what i want to first uh, uh speak about is that uh, climate change is no longer or cannot be looked at as a national territorial issue it is a transnational and a transboundary issue it uh is very wide and vast uh, for instance just to um it's so it's not something just that we speak in uh, elite uh, spaces but it has very uh, much implications at the grassroots level and uh, for instance india shares uh, is several uh, transboundary rivers with our neighbors so whether it's the brahma ganga up tista with bangladesh or whether it is the kabul basin or whether it's the indus uh, basin with pakistan or whether it is the kosi mahakali or the gandak rivers with nepal so there is we have a uh, uh, natural resources are are, uh, are across spatially uh, located across national boundaries and climate change very much affects uh, say water bodies or uh, forests and they have or uh, certain kinds of biodiverse regions such as the sundarbans they are transnational and transboundary issues therefore we'll have to tackle it with a uh, a multilateral perspective and through global cooperation and and dialogue it cannot be done by just one nation so feminine this foreign takes the policies how are these policies made and how does international relationship uh, international relationships uh, kind of get mediated in in the process i'm turning off my video because of internet bandwidth just so that the slides can be uh, more uh, prominent without any problems uh, so in the context of um, so therefore within this foreign policy we want to locate gender and we want to locate uh, it within the within the framework of rights human rights social and environmental justice and gender justice so um, the recent uh, con recently concluded uh, g20 delhi declaration the, the last uh, 
aspects of the declaration was about gender inclusion in climate action and uh, it is it is welcome but we have to look at the challenges also there are several uh, canonical canonical global texts whether it's the sustainable development goals whether whether it is the paris crime climate accord uh, uh, all of these canonical global texts have provisions for gender and uh, in the indian context you have the prime minister's 10 point agenda for uh, which also includes the need uh, for to bring integrate a gender consciousness into uh, climate thinking and climate thought so uh, why do we need to integrate a gender consciousness consciousness within climate thought is simply uh, looking at the questions of climate justice the people who are least likely to contribute to climate change are the most likely to be affected by climate change okay and climate change is not gender neutral there is disproportionate burden on women gender minorities sexual minorities uh transgender non-binary or uh, communities <clears throat> intersex persons so across the gender spectrum the disproportionate vulnerabilities is uh, uh you know climate change impacts uh, different identities differently and these are the groups least likely to contribute to climate change least likely to be able to afford energy or least likely to be able to you know get on a plane and fly across the globe least so the least carbon footprint but they are the ones who are most likely to be affected by climate change so there are ethical dimensions and one has to therefore frame it as a legal and a political issue beyond the scope of just one nation but as a multilateral dialogic globally uh, involving praxis so justice outcomes it's not only about reduction in greenhouse gases but also uh, one has to go and look at sustainable livelihood creation and compensation because there is uh, it's uh, it's not enough to just say these are polluting livelihoods so these are polluting occupations but what do those communities uh, what alternatives are available to them in the last g20 where the brisbane goal was introduced and the brisbane goal stated that we need to bridge the uh, the uh, gender gap in the workforce and uh, by 2025 bring 100 million more women globally into the labor market and uh, the, so we're still behind on some of these goals and these are very much I'll, I'll link it to why I'll talk about why these aspects are important in a climate uh, change or a climate we, it's no longer about climate change I think we have to talk about it as climatic crises uh, so uh, one of the reasons is that climate change has a great impact on certain sections of the population, especially those most reliant on certain kinds of natural resources. They have the least capacity and uh, in, with their current means to respond to natural hazards themselves, uh, droughts, landslides, floods, hurricanes, and it it is a gendered phenomenon because uh, there is a, a women are the poorest of the poor um, from the economic sense there is a feminization of uh, poverty and uh, they are going to be greatest burdens and impacts of climate change will be on women and there is also on the other side uh, unequal participation in decision making processes and the labor market to be able to cope with and respond to the crises that affects them so this is a brief framework that we had created for uh, one of my along with one of my senior pro colleagues and professors in the department professor janki andaria we uh, created this framework together how do you look at the gen uh, gender development and climate change so current developmental process we have a very extractive relationship with the environment owing to uh, you know unsustainable uses of natural resources certain forms of uh, urbanization certain forms of industrialization that are great pollutants great polluters and these anthropogenic activity on the environment brings about climate change in what way by rising sea levels decreased rainfall agricultural short falls floods droughts uh, glacial lake melting global warming and forest fires a range of natural and uh, you know climatic changes over a period of time owing to our unsustainable 
ways of living and modernist pursuit of development. And these have certain kinds of impact. It undermines poor livelihoods. It brings about distress migration, displacement, food security, and women and uh, gender minorities <clears throat> are the most marginalized and they are their labor is concentrated in the informal sector, which is characterized by lack of uh, protective legislations. There might be a few, but they are insufficient social security. So these impacts are gendered because who is the poorest of the poor, who fall outside formal la labor economy, who is most dependent on the natural environment for subsistence, who are the people who face the burdens of family and market and the neoliberal state and the welfare uh, reductions and dilutions. And what are the social and political barriers? And this is not just within a, a national context, but it has to be looked as a global and a transnational context. And we also have very weak institutional arrangements. The simple thing is we don't have gender disaggregated data. So the, the next census is yet to come. And uh, the gender needs get subsumed under the household and development policies don't reach intended beneficiaries. So there is a major link between the way in which climate change is produced, caused through pursuit of certain kinds of developmental models and its impact on different genders. So we also have the social cultural uh, foundation of vulnerability see within the disaster and climate studies we're very much concerned about who is vulnerable and these are some figures that put up on the left but what i want to actually talk about is if there is a one two three degree centigrade rise in temperatures what is going to happen because all your global policies today talk about keeping temperature you know next zero and bringing about temperature reduction or keeping it at two degrees but if there is a one two three degree rise one is you will have uh, increase in sea level rise uh, and other forms of natural disasters there'll also be less rainfall flooding uh, implications for food production and agricultural shortfalls who is going to experience the brunt of this primarily the women and uh, the most marginalized groups that are concentrated in the uh, informal sector with very less access to formal markets formal credit formal um, social protection structures. So there is also a gender division of labor. There's an increased burden on women for water and fuel collection. They have to travel longer distances, household water management, water procurement, managing food, managing kitchen garden, livestock handling. And these are also uh, embedded in the context of caste and uh, landlessness and, and so on. Because, uh, you know, women own less than 5% uh, uh, of land in their own names and the landless agricultural laborers are primarily the lower castes. So, so a, a, even a one to three degree centigrade rise in temperature is going to have deep socio-economic vulnerability. So we have seen that therefore a disaster and climate risk, climate change brings about extreme weather events, whether it is flooding, droughts, heat waves, and they cannot be mitigated in a gender blind or a gender uh, neutral manner. Right. So uh, and post disasters as well. I mean, uh, there's restricted access to rescue relief compensation. Uh, uh, now we are talking about in including them in policy, talking about gender within the arena of policy making. But there is a lot of uh, uh, literature and there's a lot of studies on how rescue relief mechanisms are of, uh, don't reach women because uh, of various social and cultural barriers. So uh, this is uh, some of the, uh, when you're talking about foreign policy, we are looking at some of the canonical uh, global uh, texts, the Paris Agreement, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Sustainable Development Goals. So this uh, uh, little diagram sort of shows how the different um, canonical global texts, the foreign policies today, uh, we have to include G20, the declarations as well in this, how they bring about the, uh, have they all have gender provisions, but uh, there is somewhere there is a problem in the implementation because only 12% of the SDGs have been achieved. And we are in 2023, 2030 is the 
sort of deadline to achieve the SDGs. And only 12% report subjects come in saying only 12%. We're not on track really with the SDGs. Uh, and there are so many other aspects of uh, how each of these policies align at the global level. But we must recognize climate change as a driver of various forms of risk. And um, uh, there's some studies that say that you know environmental refugees or climate refugees as, as a new category uh, is uh, upcoming in the context of uh, various extreme events. So this is in Pakistan and um, uh, they are, uh, women are extremely vulnerable in the post disaster scenario with the increase in trafficking or 70% of those displaced in a certain area in Pakistan post the floods were, were women. And uh, therefore, what does a feminist uh, framework for climate action even looks, uh, looks does it even look like? Uh, how am I doing on time, ma'am? Um, can I take another two minutes? Okay. Yeah, yeah, please yes, go ahead. Yeah, that's yeah. So uh, the feminist uh, framework for climate action is first to recognize the that uh, women, gender minorities, sexual minorities, and the identities across the gender spectrum are not they're not homogeneous groups. There is a lot of diversity, a lot of heterogeneity. And the, uh, so it cannot be an add and stir approach where we just bring in gender into the discussion and start talking about gender as though it is one category. One has to look at the several nuances of within the identity. And decision-making, uh, uh, Professor Vibhuti also spoke about it in her opening uh, remarks, that uh, there has to be inclusive decision-making where women and gender diverse individuals are uh, integrated into decentralized forms of governance. The Grama Panchayat in the Indian context, in the Gram Sabhas, uh, can be uh, the, can be extended to look at, to become climate assemblies in a way and to see how uh, the local uh, you know um, uh, local issues uh, can be brought uh, from a climate change lens to these climate assemblies it's it's uh, just a thought to see how we can uh, extend the perhaps the functioning of the panchayati raj systems at the grassroots levels and uh, there we must address the fact that climate related disasters uh, there's a, there's, there is a pattern of violence that always manifests whenever there is a natural disaster, uh, which is fueled by extreme uh, an extreme weather event uh, coming from the climate change perspective. And whether it is trafficking or whether it is um, uh, rape in uh, shelter homes, there is a huge uh, gender-based violence, which often gets neglected or invisibilized while speaking about climate change, because uh, in such calamitous conditions, women uh, often lose, uh, uh, quote unquote, uh, the men. Uh, they're separated from the male members in the household and uh, or, or they, they, they become orphaned and so on, and they, they are susceptible to a lot of violence. We saw this in the COVID era as well, where there was an increase in gender-based violence and domestic violence. And it is very, so we cannot, this is an invisible and neglected area within the climate discourse, but that we must look at. And uh, decision-making has to also look at resource distribution and redistribution of uh, resources access to minor forest produce access to water access to uh, you know subs agricultural subsidies women are not irrigators access to uh, being able to make irrigation decisions these are some of the, the small and marginal farmers who are you know women do a lot of work on the farm so uh, so they they are excluded from irrigation decisions and so on so so all of this is uh, so in order to bring about and promote a gender responsive climate policy, we need gender responsive budgeting within the climate financing uh, scenario, there has to be uh, gender responsive budgeting and also in order to bring about policy shifts and changes, we require disaggregated data. Right. And uh, so all of this will lead to what we are calling sustainable development and uh, the uh, you uh, look at women not just as victims of climate change but those le who are, they can be seen as leaders innovators and decision making in environmental initiatives because there are a lot of grassroots level work uh, especially with women in the environment uh, are, in, are done are uh, very much gendered in nature so these are the uh, sustainable development goals where we uh, which is five which is uh, 
uh, gender equality and uh, they cut across several aspects which are important for climate change which is uh, consumption patterns which is sdg12 uh, then there is uh, sdg17 that is meeting resources and partnerships then uh, water sdg6 is water energy 7 so there are it's a cross cutting theme across several uh, goals which cannot be ignored and uh, uh, therefore i want to end on this note that uh, Yes, foreign policy uh, has to have some bureaucratic will and has to be translated and implemented at the grassroots level. It, it cannot just be relegated uh, to the uh, academic and uh, you know the bureaucratic level. There has to be certain kind of translation, operationalization. So I will stop at this point and we will, uh, I mean, over to you, uh, Professor Vipudi. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lavanya, for giving such a comprehensive view of the uh, whole subject of climate change. And you also brought out the very important that why it is a transnational issue. We need to have multilateral perspective and there are ethical dimensions also you have brought in. Who creates the uh, anthropogenic uh, calamities and who is uh, paying the price? of it, a need for gender desegregated data and the political will and the uh, role of the local level organization such as the Panchayati Raj institution in the Indian context. I think in every local urban and rural local self-government bodies, I think that's very important concern. The only uh, question that I, uh, uh, and I think that can be taken, all the questions we will take at the and because there are two questions in the uh, question box. So now can we move to uh, second speaker, our, uh, our veteran feminist, uh, Ms. Farid Akhtar. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your remarks and thank you, Lavanya, ma'am, for such an enriching start. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Farid Akhtar, ma'am, to take... Just a request from the participants. Can you share your PPT on the chat box? Uh, well, Lavanya, they are asking for your PPT. I have shared the book on the PPT. You can download it from the chat box. Yeah. Yes, Farida, please. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you very much, you know, for inviting me to this very important, uh, uh, you know, discussion on fem uh, feminist foreign policy and climate change. But in the beginning, I want to say that I lost my mother one week ago on 11th September. So I want to dedicate my talk to Anwara Begum. Her name is Anwara Begum. And um, so that I pay some respect to her, you know, because she was a great supporter of our work. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I would go, uh, you know, thank you, uh, Lavunna, that you have given a very good uh, background of climate disasters and everything, which is common to us as well. But I would like to take, uh, you know, a bit critical or skeptical view of um, a feminist uh, foreign policy because it originated not because it originated in the Western countries, but because I have seen that the issues they have raised uh, so far were like, of course, gender equality, you know, gender injustice and everything, but it was more Eurocentric. And, uh, you know, so we found that uh, when uh, Mexico joined in, you know, after Sweden started it, and when Mexico joined in, then it talked about uh, like all the uh, other issues like structural gender differences, inequalities, working towards a more justice, a just and prosperous society. So these are issues that may not be needed in the Western uh, countries, but in our uh, context, it is very important. Another uh, thing that I wanted to raise was um, you know, in 1974, you know, the Bucharest conference was held in uh, Romania, and it was about population policy. And then she, uh, they, in that meeting, they realized that unless you involve women into 
um, development uh, works, uh, the population control policy will not be successful. So then they included women in the name of women and development, women in development, all these things came later, but women became the means to achieve population control goals. So I, I just wanted to uh, raise that issue because it's not only just uh, bringing more women into um, in the policy, the climate policy making bodies, but, um, uh, but also what issues we are bringing in, how we are, uh, like uh, Labunno said very nicely, and also Bibhuti said very nicely that not to take women as victims only, you know, of climate change. They are, um, in fact, um, they have to challenge these anthropogenic causes and the corporate um, solutions that are given to us. So this is one of the things that when I was preparing uh, for this um, meeting, I, I looked, went through some of the things and I found that uh, they do recognize the disproportionate impact of climate change on women. It's, it's, there is no doubt about it. And it's, it's very true. And, um, uh, and also for, for feminist foreign policy um, does acknowledge that. But I think before feminist foreign policy was introduced in 2014 by Margot um, uh, of uh, Sweden, um, uh, Christina Figueres, uh, who was UN, UN climate chief, who was uh, there in uh, 2010 to 2016, and also Mary Robinson, who was ex-Irish uh, foreign uh, prime minister and also human rights commissioner. They recognized this issue when they were in the meetings, as Christina uh, said many times that more often than not, we are in a minority, even though she was a chief, she recognized that quite often I'm the only woman in the room. That's not right. So she definitely felt the difference in taking policies on climate change because that is cross border. So whatever decision is taken in United States or in, um, in UK, it affects us all. If they don't reduce carbon, um, you know, emissions, it affects us. So there are a lot of things that we need to tell them. But Christina uh, just felt that it was uh, uh, the lacking words there. Like Vedo has done one uh, statistics, which is very interesting, that um, women's underrepresentation in the UN climate decision-making bodies, uh, particularly on the high level committees, delivering climate action, which was less than 25% seats. And just 29% of the 5,090 delegates at the Doha conference in 2012 were female. So, but in the like the uh, other uh, civil society forums, we see more women, more active women, but in the official uh, groups, they are um, not there. In fact, Mary Robinson also was very upset that there was nothing about human rights and nothing about gender. So the, at the UN level, it is really uh, gender, uh, you know, it's just a rhetoric they talk about, but, and it's very uh, alarming or I'm a bit worried that the present UN climate chief is the former Grenada minister, Simon Steele. So anyway, it's a man, uh, that is not the main question, but the problem is his background seems to be more in technology than in real issues of people. He was a senior, in senior positions in a number of industry leading companies like Sealing, Silicon Valley based technology, up to corporations like Lokia and GSC. So I think these all matter to us, you know, in the end. So this is what I, I really wanted to mention um, as a global issue because it affects us. And then, but it was also true 
the, as Mary Robinson Court said that um, as she fought to bring more women into the policy bodies. So when there were more indigenous women who spoke out, the policymakers were just realizing that, uh, oh, something else is there that is happening and they have to look at that. So bringing more real women, those who are sufferers, I think um, made a difference. UNFCC uh, held on, you know, on March 8th, they celebrated uh, March 8th um, yeah. this year. And for them, the main compelling reasons are um, to engage women um, to tackling climate change with diverse experience and uh, all this and that and gender action plan under UNFCC calls for women's full, equal and meaningful participation in the international climate processes. I'm just a bit uh, concerned that it should not, again, I should, I'm saying that um, when UNFCC talks about bringing more women or making women work on climate actions, that it should women should not become the means again to to other goals, you know. Um, so that is uh, so. Uh, I think we have a role to play. That what we want, and we also have want to um, challenge that the GHG emitters, the CO two emitters, must stop carbon emissions immediately. And that you know why the conference of the parties of the UNFCC are failing without any commitment of carbon emissions. Why the developed countries, you know, here my question is that feminist foreign policies adopted in the, the countries, um, you know, like Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, do they question um, uh, these things at the uh, UNFCC meetings? So this is what, um, is a question that I would like to raise. And structural, uh, you know, so like uh, my main uh, message is like uh, feminist foreign climate policy should be to challenge the male and arrogant attitude of the developed nations not to who are not reducing carbon emissions and also offer false solutions. This is one thing that Bibhuti, my Professor Bibhuti, I want to uh, you know, reiterate that they are now talking about false solutions. They talk about nature-based solutions as if those are in favor of the people. So nature-based solutions are not all nature-based. They talk about net zero, but net zero is not zero. It is just net zero. That means they will continue to emit carbon and uh, and also do something like put uh, uh, plant some trees or on the one hand they will continue to deforest uh, Amazon and also in our countries but um, they will do on their own way. So this is what I I really want to say. But I in a way feminist foreign um, climate policy should have to acknowledge the existence of real solution, not the false solution, that the communities in the global south, like our indigenous people, peasants, fishers, and pastoralists, the communities have been struggling against extractive projects and the impacts of climate change. Women are defenders within their communities and are guardians of the world's remaining biodiversity. Women are also the ones who feed the world. And um, uh, Priti uh, has visited our place and you know our farmers are really working on climate resistant varieties of uh, uh, seeds and they are really uh, um, addressing the flood, uh, floods and drought conditions with their own knowledge and uh, their practices. And, uh, and then also uh, the forest management and other things, you know, that indigenous people, they, they, it is their right to have 
the, uh, the access to uh, for, well, you know the for, uh, forest so uh, they talk about soil carbon offsets and uh, so-called offsets are nothing but an excuse for for big emitters to continue business as usual so we cannot be naive we just come up and really involve women in all this lastly i would like to say that on, in on june 5th this year vandana shiva and all others we are in a network called diverse women for diversity in march we got together to adopt an eco feminist manifesto which i can share with you um uh, which was uh, you know um, launched in uh, rome on the on 5th of june and the manifesto clearly denounces all industrial and false solutions towards food although the world is being increasingly controlled by surveillance capitalism and the financialization of life forms the diverse women for diversity does not accept any form of gene editing and genetic engineering in crops and animals these are fake foods created for corporate profits diverse women for diversity calls for an end to contamination distortions and colonization of our foods so the diverse uh, dwd calls for the imperative transition into local biodiverse ecological systems that work in harmony with nature it declares we need diversity in food systems diversity in seeds diversity in economies our culture and language diversity and the diversity of our struggles connects us all you know i think you know these are all connected and these are all necessary for a feminist climate uh, policy and um, that's all i have to say at this moment thank you thank you ms parida for a very important uh, like great signals that you have shown over the discourses on climate change but you ended with an optimistic note of diverse women for diversity i was recently in bali and i also there were only conference of asia pacific youth from indigenous community and i think that also gave was very hope generating how they are fighting for the uh, diversity and also connecting it to the climate issues yeah in the midst of so many hopeless uh, uh, developments we see the ray of hope in this kind of efforts at the ground level thank you very much yes now over to ms priti daruka thank, thank you so ma'am for the, your remarks and now i would like uh, to invite priti ma'am over to you ma'am thank you very much uh, it is such a honor to be on this panel with such esteemed uh, experts uh, vibhuti ji thank you so much and arjun ji thank you for organizing this and inviting me it's really a pleasure to be here uh, before i make my intervention i just wanted to share i am going to talk about from a global south feminist and i'm as i was introduced as a founder and a global coordinator for brics feminist watch brics feminist watch is a global south feminist alliance we particularly work across uh, global south countries with feminists in bringing a very uh, south based analysis and agenda to highest level of policy making by our very this thing we of course channel the or question uh the western or the north based domination not just by country but also in our uh feminist circle and therefore we have a very different or a uh, more grounded south uh perspective in global policy spaces so just to uh start with i want to appreciate also all that was shared before me uh vibhuti ji thank you so much for reminding us of the strength robust power of our global feminist movements right from 1985 with nairobi coming to beijing and how solidarity and how common agendas in those days without fax or emails 
uh, without emails actually, fax existed without mobile and all, we were able to accomplish. Uh, but that was the power of the women's, women's uh, global movement should not be confused with feminist foreign policy. Uh, what we achieved was women's uh, or feminist movement uh, globally. That solidarity was established. The linkages, connections, all those are very important and that was made. I also want to appreciate what Lavinia so explicitly and in-depth shared with us the need for bringing gender dimensions and feminist analysis in the whole climate and locating women's leadership in decision making as well as solution. Absolutely, I think Lavanya, no one will disagree with that. Uh, but uh, the question is feminist foreign policy. And of course, my dear friend Farida, uh, we go back many years and it's always a pleasure to hear her knowledge, expertise, and how she works so tirelessly with such commitment with women farmers on the ground. So it's a pleasure and uh, Farida ji, and I know Saida is also in the audience. My big hug to you. And I do want to send my condolences for your immense loss. My love, my dear. Okay, so, you know, we know as Vibhuti ji shared that few countries now have developed a feminist foreign policy. And when you hear, like as a, I identify myself as a feminist, and when I hear, somehow you feel, I felt very glad, like, okay, there is some very promising trends uh, and hope to see these fe uh, feminist foreign policies based on national, internal conversation needs, strategy. And so I do want to congratulate all the countries who have gone through that and maybe have uh, accomplished that. And when I first heard as feminist foreign policy, uh, I was totally, I would say, ooh la la, I was totally seduced by it as a feminist, right? What more can you ask? Like countries are talking about feminist foreign policy. Um, I'm still very interested in the idea how gender is much more integrated in diplomatic activities of a country. As a Global South feminist, my interventions today, like I know the past speakers have dealt very extensively and beautifully in the whole climate justice. I will touch on that in the second part of my presentation, but I first want to unpack this whole thing about feminist foreign policy. Uh, so I want to make my interventions today coming from Global South, and I identify myself as a decolonial feminist. So the greatest event in world history in the 20th century is decolonization. Although countries achieved independence from their past colonizers, the process of colonization continues to be an ongoing process, and this has both opportunities as well as challenges. And the discussions around feminist foreign policy is very much located in this. There are two components to the feminist foreign policy. One is the actual process. How does a country actually gets to having a feminist foreign policy? And the second is what is the content of this policy? How does a country decide what its feminist foreign policy should be? Now, when a few months ago, I was on a panel, a similar kind of a webinar, where the Swedish foreign minister, former minister, shared that, uh, you know, of course, Sweden was the first country in 2014 to uh, develop a feminist foreign policy. However, last year, I think with the change in government, they have retrieved it. They don't no longer have a feminist foreign policy. So it's a very interesting development. So she shared in the, on this webinar that the conversations to actually have a feminist foreign policy started in the early 80s or late 70s, that is 1970, 40 years ago. It took Sweden 40 years of various stakeholders discussion, consultation, and extensive dialogues at country level, whether it should be called foreign policy, whether it should be feminist, what should be the content of it, before they reached the stage in 2014, where everyone, there was consensus, there was after much debate and dialogue, it was agreed and the feminist foreign policy was put forward. This national process is absolutely crucial. It is not just crucial for feminist foreign policy, but as we always question our government, where magically overnight the parliament passes a policy and we say, where, where was the national conversation? No one knew about it. So it, if we demand and a demand for feminist foreign policy, 
should come from the country, should come from the women's movement within the country. It should be homegrown. It should not be imposed from outside. However trendy, seductive, sexy it might be, how much well it might be funded, this has to be a homegrown exercise. The way Sweden shared it, that it was a totally homegrown uh, conversation. And then they reached the thing that Sweden, the country, whatever their parameters, how they identified themselves as, they needed something called feminist foreign policy. Hence, they went forward on it. So what is the impact of these some Western North countries now adopting feminist foreign policy? So there are like, yes, there's Mexico as Farida Ji shared, there's Mexico, Chile. I think there's one more, is it Libya? There are three countries in the South who have also developed uh, uh, this thing. But because Western North countries have developed a feminist foreign policy, this is now being pushed on other countries. In India, it's heavily pushed by Europe through funding as a good thing that all countries now should have a feminist sea. We in the West, we not people have got it. So people in the South, you guys should also have this. In India, for example, there is heavy funding by European funders, especially Germans, around feminist foreign policy related work, which includes research, dialogue, events, roundtable. Satyam shared the book and talked about it. I'm sure German and European funders were behind it. And the publication comes out as a knowledge piece. As a decolonial feminist, this has the same colonial mindset. Even after territorial freedom, there continues still to be this kind of imposition of universal narrative, a global linear thinking based on westernization that continues to unfortunately colonize our mind. This form of colonization is used to legitimize Western knowledge through artificial universalization. We've gotten it in our countries here, so it's a good thing. If you don't have it, that means you're backward. You're not doing the right thing. You are not talking about women's rights and gender and women's empowerment. Uh, and so you need to develop it. The work in India around feminist foreign policy, of course, is funded by Europe. And it's quite strategically presented as a local initiative. And the Eurocentric origins are concealed. This also is artificial positioning, a particular kind of reasoning, knowledge, epistemology, and is therefore silencing local realities, context, and narratives. This is not a homegrown demand. It is being imposed from outside uh, very strategically, and we need to be mindful of it. Germany in March got feminist foreign policy. Of course, uh, no, they got it in, I think, two years ago, but in March, they adopted the guidelines. And I would really encourage you to read uh, what the uh, woman minister from Germany in its introduction to the guidelines talks about. It mentions how the Ukraine, how uh, the, due to the Ukraine war, the women in Ukraine, the plight of Ukraine, women in Ukraine, then she talks about Iranian women and the kind of situation they are. Haven't we had enough of this? Do we want Western countries to come and save us and talk about their foreign policy as we poor thing and please not come and save? I think the colonial period is over and we need to send a very strong message that we really don't, no one in the South needs saving. We are very capable of dealing with our issues. And so uh, this colonial mindset has a racist, has a patronizing a tone to it and it positions the West as the do-gooder and it positions the South as the problems that need to be taken care of. So why is this artificial universalization of feminist foreign policy a problem? What these efforts are also doing indirectly is creating what is acceptable as a good gender equality indicator. So if you have a, if a country has a feminist foreign policy, that means you're a good country. Does that mean all that we talk about and all that we as women leaders and feminist leaders, we work and we do right from the ground level to policy level, all that is meaningless. There was such good in, uh, analysis that was shared just by my panelists before me. Where is all this coming from? This is all great feminist work. There is also a homogenization process. That means that gender equality component in a country's foreign policy should only come as feminist foreign policy. 
does this mean like okay the gender aspect and and inclusion of feminist analysis in climate justice conversation is important but why does it have to come as a feminist foreign policy it is part of our climate justice uh, policy it is part of everything that the country does it should be part of all our other policies what is this that why this all of a sudden this has to be part of like what is called the feminist foreign policy this also renders national components approaches to gender equality within a country's foreign policy as inadequate and invisible so what i've seen is all the work like i'm not uh, i have not read your book so please forgive me if i overly generalize it but so far what i have seen in terms of the knowledge produced around feminist foreign policy in indian context is it shows how the other countries what are the content in their foreign policy and how india doesn't have all this so india is lacking and india needs to do all this in order to so the all the countries have strived to then in this this kind of approach what it does is that uh, all the countries have to strive to rise to standard that is set by the west it also reiterates that west knows the best and what west does it good for good for all and so we all should be doing it so west many countries have adopted the foreign policy feminist foreign policy oh wow as i said i was seduced by it i felt oh wow but then you step back and you think does it is it relevant in our context what does it mean and does it really mean that we in our countries don't talk about women's equality or empowerment or we only need to talk about all these things the way the west is framing it as having okay then let's look at all the countries that have developed feminist foreign policy sweden germany canada all the north i'm counting luxembourg france spain netherlands are have they become better countries and how has the uh, how do the feminist of these countries feel when in 2020 when the world faced the worst crisis i'm talking about the covid 19 european countries and member of the european union voted against trip waivers for vaccine denying millions of people around the world this life saving drug these countries with fem feminist foreign policy stood with pharma companies and stood for corporate profits yet these countries are self proclaim as humanitarian human rights gender equality countries and they are the ones who have the standard can we ask then from global south because these countries fail to save millions and millions of people affected by covid can we ask these countries now to be downgraded from their self proclaimed humanitarian status also it is it is important now with the ukraine war going on and to see what the position is so uh, uh, of course sweden has talked about it want to join nato membership there are many other countries in in who have feminist foreign policy who also talk about nato expansion militarization germany for example is the fourth largest weapon producer in the world is this feminist approach shouldn't a feminist approach to foreign policy if as a feminist i might be naive i might be very like you know uh idealistic but i would say as feminist i, I would think human centric approach would be very much part of feminist foreign policy and it would of course focus on dismantling global economic political structures that reproduce gender inequality as well as other forms of exclusion discrimination injustice do you see any of these countries doing that can they really claim that they have now feminist foreign policy and so they can talk about gender equality or are they actually through their foreign policy militarization whatever else we can talk about actually perpetuating equality in the world as feminists we are also very strong and skeptical towards military solution right like we stand against all forms of violence and to sec and security challenge we always prioritize human rights civil society engagement which will include demilitarization multilateralism diplomatic engagement now do any of these countries which have developed feminist foreign policy and proclaim now let's like you know let's ask all the other countries to have this are these really our role models 
are these really countries standing behind feminist principles? So India doesn't have feminist foreign policy so far. And the discussions like, you know, have been in very elite circle. I've been part of some. And, you know, uh, of course, it is being funded by outside. It's not a local uh, women's movement conversation that has homegrown, talking to various stakeholders and emerge. And so uh, it is a foreign implant. And we need to just raise our antenna to that. I would even go forward and say, this is what coloniality looks like. Now let's look at, okay, these countries are talking about feminist foreign policy. We have at least five, six uh, European countries there. Then why is it that only 1% of total global aid goes to women's rights? Why has this number not changed when so many countries from the developed world who are major donors of development aid? So what is this feminist and gender equality? They are not neither being you know, uh, actually promoting gender equality if that 1% hasn't changed over the years. This is not just in BRICS feminist wars. These are similar sentiments shared by African feminists, Latin American. As South feminists, we really feel that uh, it is something for us to be mindful of. So what does India have then? So if we look at it in uh, 2022, that is last year, during our independence speech, uh, the prime minister of, this is of course called Amrit Kal, which is the 25 year period uh, from 75th anniversary of India's independence to the centenary celebration. The 25 years is called Amrit Kal. And in this period, India has set a goal for itself that it will totally decolonize by itself. When 2047 come, when India will celebrate 100 years of its independence, India would be totally decolonized. It's not a goal for an individual. This is a goal which has been given to the country. And this is the driving force within India in all our thinking, discussions, celebrations, strategic intervention. The decolonial approach is very much become our uh, collective uh, thinking in a way, we are critical about it. We are not accepting everything that is thrown at us, but we are having very interesting conversations there. For example, India and its G20 presidency this year, the maxim for G20 was Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which literally means whole world is one family. It further refers to India's advocacy, which was the, you know, the tagline, one earth, one family, one future. And this is, of course, mentioned like not to uh, bring out our uh, Hindu scriptures, but it comes from the Maha Upanishad. Additionally, how does the concept of foreign as a foreign policy relate to the notion of one world family, which means that there is nothing foreign. The collective consciousness of our land believes that the whole universe, which we call Brahman, is within ourselves. The same energy that is within me is the same energy which is in everyone else, which is in the plants, flower, it's in the table, chair, it's in everything, is the same consciousness that exists in each one of us. And that is the only truth. And whatever is outside is an illusion or a maya. And so there is a oneness to this universal truth that our collective consciousness of this land believes. And hence, in this collective Indian consciousness, there is nothing foreign or other. During COVID crisis, for example, like I gave you the example where the European countries with the wonderful feminist foreign policy stood on, on the vaccine distribution. India was the pharmacy to the world. When all Western countries with feminists stood with pharm pharmaceutical companies for their profit and said no to trip waiver, India vac not only vaccinated its 1.4 billion, billion population, but it's also provided vaccine and critical drugs free of cost to 150 countries. Now let's look at the word feminism or feminist. Like I would love it, I identify very openly as a feminist and I believe in feminist policy, feminism. It's very much part of my political thinking, but it's not part of our social fabric or our policy discussion. That doesn't mean India doesn't have frameworks of gender equality or women's empowerment. 
it doesn't mean that if only if we talk about feminist or feminism that gender equality and women's empowerment can be it comes in in a different context reality language and it doesn't mean that we don't have our problems also there are enough problems there's no way what i'm saying is that we don't have issues of uh, inequality discrimination and the horrific some of the horrific uh, uh, situations not to even forget uh, the 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 situation that is happening in manipur the violence or a uh, uh, women wrestlers so all all that i'm not negating that but that doesn't mean that in our policy framework we do not have concepts of gender equality women's empowerment etc i also want to i know lavinia talked about this little bit i want to go a little uh, further in this which is women led development which is one of the key themes of g20 uh, was one of the key themes overarching cross cutting themes in g20 so this was not a theme for women 20 or a gender working group but india wanted to change the narrative and made women led development as a overarching theme for g20 under its presidency now under women led development women are not just beneficiaries of development instead they set the agenda for development at ana he uh, at to achieve the sdg goals as leaders and equal participants the concept as such taps into a long established approach in development theory which calls for inclusion of women in development planning and decision so are women in development that whole theory analysis like you can trace i'm sure the academic experts on this panel or in this who are there today no it goes back to 30 40 years how this whole concept of women in development have have unfolded and how today when we look at women led development it has some of the same uh, key building blocks or uh, principles that we as feminists have been talking about which is recognizing going beyond looking at women as just beneficiary but recognizing women's leadership inclusion of women in decision making and participation and recognizing that she comes in the woman comes in with skills and knowledge and is not just a passive welfare receiver okay now let's look at quickly look at uh, a g20 declaration and particularly look at what this approach like uh, what i want to highlight to is that women led development not feminist foreign policy is india's what would i say policy framework on gender equality which india should put its all its muscle might and strength and export it as in its all its diplomatic uh, 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 you know processes and all it it had it resonates with our narrative it came from india there were many conversations around it all stakeholders participated in and we have just started unpack and building a framework and i think we should own it and stay with it and claim it and really really build it as a framework that works for us and is not imposed from outside so let's look at the g20 declaration so we got many like because women led development was a overarching theme so g20 affirms that gender equality is a fundamental importance and investing in empowerment of women and girls has a multiplier effect right it also encourages g20 encourages women led development and remains committed to enhancing women's full equal effective meaningful participation as decision maker for addressing global challenges inclusively in contributing as active participants in all spheres of society across all sectors at all levels of economy which is not only crucial for achieving gender but also for contributing to global gdp growth this we got from india's g20 presidency under women led development it also talks about to promote investment in availability accessibility now of course we recognize that one of the major obstacles for women's empowerment is the unequal burden of care is unpaid work and care responsibility so this declaration talks about available accessible affordable social infrastructure to address the unequal distribution of paid and unpaid care domestic work 
So it's also distribution. You look at it, how much uh, we have achieved and it has all come from our local conversations, debates, discussion, which have happened in the last 10 months, 11 months and building from all the years of work that has happened in this country. Uh, uh, you know, and bringing that forward. G20 also talks about, which is really like eliminate gender stereotypes and biases and change norms, attitudes, behavior that perpetuate gender inequality. So if you ask, like as feminists, we know this is the where patriarchy is. This is where the root cause of discrimination inequality is. And to get such a important G20 declaration to recognize that, a big achievement. It doesn't mean anything has changed on the ground. You still need to do the work and put pressure to get it implemented. But the fact that it got into the declaration itself is a is some kind of a hope it gives. It also opens up that we need to do additional work. Now, under climate justice and women, now this is what, of course, Lavinia and others, they talked about it. And I just want to take you a little deeper into what we got in the G20 declaration. Acknowledging the disproportionate impact of climate change, biodiversity loss, desertification, and pollution on all women and girls, accelerating climate action must have gender equality at its core. Can we ask, like, you know, of course, we can strengthen it further, but this we got in G20. G20 will support increased women's participation, partnership decision making, leadership in climate change mitigation and adaption and disaster risk reduction strategies and policy framework on environmental issues. This is women's leadership, participation in decision-making and climate change. How useful is that, that, that particular uh, uh, point that we got in G20 declaration? It further talks about support of gender responsive and environment resilient solution, including water sanitation and, uh, and hygiene. And it talks about a uh, woman's role in all the climate change processes. The second thing I wanted to highlight as a framework, I hope I'm okay on time. If I may just take a couple more minutes to put forward. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Is the concept of life, lifestyle for environment. This was introduced by our prime minister at COP26 in Glasgow in 2021 as an international mass movement towards mindful and deliberate utilization instead of mindless and destructive consumption to protect and preserve the environment. Now, life has, of course, an individual and collective duty in everyone to live a life that is in tune with the earth and that doesn't harm it. Now, this again resonates very much with indigenous culture, rural community, with most of the global south lifestyle. It indirectly also critiques the Western patterns of consumption and the over uh, exploitation of nature uh, and where the actual pollution and destruction of climate actually happens. The concept of life is of course drawn from Indian indigenous practices globally and also re has references to uh, the uh, scriptures or text from this region. There are some great examples also of decolonial approach in policy in, in Indian, like, you know, if you look at it, what we got, okay, let's just look at what does this life uh, give us in the G20 declaration. It talks about three, three main pillars. It refers to there was a high level uh, uh, principle, there were G20 high level principles on life which were adopted and the G20 declaration totally stands by these high level principles. It has three key pillars and then it illustrates nine principles. I would encourage you to definitely go and check them out. The three key pillars it talks about is that G20 commits to robust collective action that will enable the world for this whole, like, you know, the production consumption pattern and mainstream lifestyle for sustainable development. The second pillar is it supports, uh, 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 no, so I'm sorry, I got confused. So robust collective action is first pillar. Second is that it should question the production and consumption pattern should be sustainable. It should not be exploitative. And the third is that there should be a creation of an enabling policy environment that is sustainable and demands climate action. 
So based on these three pillars, there are nine principles that are developed. I would encourage you to definitely go and uh, check them out. They are all there on the G20 uh, website. Now, what India is doing is very deliberately, strategically, is drawing from a collective consciousness knowledge of its culture, history, from what, what is the uh, tradition, culture, patterns, knowledge, skill of this land and developing frameworks, paradigms, and policy briefs that are relevant to our context. And then that is being made and it has been brought into the G20, which is of course a global this thing. And we hope it gets like uh, some of these things that have come forward very much resonates with our, uh, our uh, communities, women on the ground. And that becomes very important also. So it is what we got on paper. We still need to see how it gets implemented or whether India will just look at this as a event. And so the event is over. So everything can be packed up and put on shelf and moving on with life. So we just want to make sure that their commitment to women-led development and what they have said under climate justice on including women is carried forward. So it's also important for us to look at, and I will put it forward, maybe others can also answer, that what makes then a policy feminist? And it's important for us to reflect and think about it. And can we come up with a framework which is not influenced by Western analysis and Western framework of gender empowerment or, or gender equality and women's empowerment, but it's very much grounded in our reality. So for example, like, you know, if I was, I was talking about the German minister in the introduction for the guidelines, and they talk about gender equality or equality between man and woman. Now in our parts of the world, and even I would say, I would elaborate even to say that in Global South, in many cultures, uh, uh, the role, gender roles were very specific. And women in general, if you look at pre-colonial period, women in general did not aspire to behave like men and they didn't feel uh, 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 you know, disempowered or they didn't feel in order to achieve their freedom or in order to be empowered, they need to behave like men. This is a binary uh, a category that, it, that was brought into our mindset and thinking from a colonial perspective that there is man, there's a woman. We didn't, our societies didn't work in these binary fashion. And you will, of course, Farida is there, will talk about the role of, for example, women in seed conservation in agriculture community. And these roles provided women a status and a recognition. And they never felt like, you know, it was, it was in a way, they didn't feel that, okay, only if I plow the land, I need to be. There was some kind of, it doesn't mean like, I'm, I know I'm getting into, a bit kind of complicated area, and I hope I don't get into trouble with other feminist sisters on the call. But I hope you understand that we really need to unpack what all these things mean from a decolonial lens and claim it for ourselves and see beyond that. So I hope uh, I'm going to stop there. And thank you so much. Thank you, Priti, for unpacking the conspiracy theories around feminist foreign policy. Uh, right from the very beginning, from 1972 till we can say 2000, feminist movement all over the world, there was so much of faith and trust. Now in today's polarized world, I think the question is a lot of doubts are there. And I think you have genuinely said, what did the feminists from advanced countries or the North do when such a major pandemic was uh, this thing? And why didn't they prevail upon the multinational pharma industry that are really genuinely very important concern. But at the same time, we should also be aware that when we talk about the indigenous approach, it should not result in uh, criminalization and brutalization of religious minorities, which is happening in so many countries in Asia. That is one thing. Secondly, when we talk about equality was a equality development peace was a slogan of the 1975 internet women's year as well as international women's decade 85, 75 to 85 and we understood it as an equality of opportunity equality of 
treatment and equality of rewards for the contribution women are making. So from that, it was that time also, it was never equality with what men are doing. If men are indulging in war, we don't want to indulge in war. Okay, So that is there. And I think your last point, very important, and even Faridaji also said, the role of women in the subsistence economy of Asia, Africa, Latin America, I think extremely important and how the uh, TNCs and I mean, multinational corporations, transnational corporation, zombie capitalism is doing major destruction of Mother Earth and also women, large majority of marginalized community. So very well taken. But I think it is your lecture has given a lot of food for thought and a lot of uh, critical thinking that we'll have to do around uh, the question of feminist foreign policy. Thank you. There are so many questions, I think. And can every all those who have asked Dr. Shivali Kumar, can you unmute yourself and ask the questions yourself? Uh, uh, yeah. Ma'am Kavatra, will you be managing the Q&A? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Harsha ji, will you be managing Q&A? Yeah. First one is Dr. Shivali Kumar. Are you there? Oh. Yes, I'm there. I'm yeah, please, please uh, unmute yourself. And just... uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. You can even show your video. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you so much uh, uh, for the very interesting uh, uh, panel discussion that has happened. It's a wide range, uh, beginning with uh, Dr. Lavanya and Farida ji and uh, then Preeti. Um, uh, uh, Vibhuti ji really encapsulated the entire panel discussion when she started off with uh, the whole idea of feminist uh, foreign policy. I have two questions which any one of us, any one of you can answer. Um, uh, but um, I, I, I have looked at, you know, you have shared, some of you have shared the strategies, uh, but uh, there is considerable knowledge of sustainable livelihoods uh, among women in most of the uh, southern countries. And uh, they largely remain, uh, you know, in one corner or they're adding star to discussions, you know, they're not really okay. brought into the center of the discussions. So how do we make them their knowledge systems as the center of the, uh, uh, you know, discussions on climate change and many others, uh, which okay. should be part of the foreign policy? Okay. Uh, how do we strategize around it and make it the core of the global discourse? That is our challenge. So if there are any strategies or any experiential ways in which uh, any one of you have done, I would like a discussion. Uh, a quick share on that and uh, shall I talk about the second question uh, okay the second question is how do we address the extremely masculine complex as you said many of you said technocratic corporate driven and scientized discussions you know the climate change seems to be out there somewhere and nothing related to people's realities and also the very masculine spaces in terms of discourse, geography, where gender is seen as a women's issue and not really about gen all genders and their responsibility too. Sometimes a lot of discourse just comes down to gender being all about women, you know, and Preeti has pointed out it's not all about women. But how do we then bring out the inequalities, the patriarchal uh, processes and the ways in which these discussions are happening in the larger global fr fr framework. For example, in G20, they, the papers are very clearly written from a feminist point of view, so-called. But actually in the ground, there was no involvement of people in the discourses that happened at the G20. Even we didn't know what's happening in the ground. There was no presence of people, even in middle-class feminists who are largely, you know, uh, seen as in most of the corridors, there was no participation. If there is no participation, how come they've come up with this kind of language? It's obviously a borrowed language. So the whole qu question of participation, who participates, how they participate, whose voice is heard and whose voice is not heard is something that we really need to, you know, think, debate and strategize around and bring these voices to forefront. So this is just a question uh, for us to think about strategy. Who would like to go first? All three of you have invited. Okay, thanks. Okay. I'll, I'll maybe very briefly. Oh, yeah, whoever. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, but. Um, you know, I would just uh, 
touch upon on the sustainable livelihood and food production issue. Um, and Shirley Kumar really pointed out very nicely. But before that, I just uh, wanted to make a comment on uh, Lavanna when she was talking about um, like our rivers are uh, transboundary rivers, you know, our uh, hillside. So we are not, um, our solutions has to be transboundary also. For example, feminists in India, are they raising the question that why Tista barrage is um, not, Tista deal is not made yet, you know? Our prime minister is going to India and Modiji talking, having nice uh, dinners, but they are not signing the treaty. And also Farakka barrage is destroying you know, the our north uh, uh, western part of Bangladesh, and really uh, it's uh, destroying our food production, and it's very, uh, very dangerous. And on the other hand, like when there is um, in Meghalaya, there is deforestation, then we get flash flood. Uh, untimely, you know, flood and that affects our food production. So these are uh, some of the things that between the two countries, how our feminists in the, these two countries can also raise the issues to our policymakers, particularly like in India, uh, you know, and say that uh, you have to do it, you know, so this is one thing. And this um, regarding, you know, the sustainable food production, you know, I, uh, we find that most of the uh, developed countries are imposing seeds, like genetically modified seeds, hybrid seeds, not only that they are imposing pesticides and chemical fertilizer and also uh, different technologies that is destroying our sustainable livelihood, sustainable food system. So uh, I don't know how feminist foreign policy uh, will help, uh, you know, in stopping all this uh, nonsense and, uh, you know, how they can, um, they can um, really help our farmers. But what we are doing, like the sovereignty question, you know, like, let's also talk about sovereignty. We should not only talk about foreign policy, we should also talk about sovereignty. So if people have sovereignty, if women have sovereignty, women's sovereignty, women's knowledge sovereignty, women's um, own sovereignty will be able to confront these, um, you know, aggressions. From, and also nowadays, I think one thing, um, Bibhuti and Priti, I think we have to accept that now there is no more states. Most of them are corporations, corporate-led corporate states. So they are actually listening to Monsanto and, and all this. So we have to understand that we have to actually, uh, we have to fight the um, uh, corporations. At this, uh, you know, this is my response. Lavanya. Uh, yes, I, I totally agree with uh, the views presented uh, by fellow panelists and also uh, by Shivli Kumar, ma'am. Uh, the indigenous uh, systems are uh, very much key to uh, the indigenous consciousness has to be integrated into climate thought. And uh, right now, I uh, I mean, as was demonstrated by very beautifully by Parida Ji and Preeti Ji, uh, there is a very top-down Western hegemonic way of uh, talking about climate change. And uh, we're not uh, adequately decolonized in the sense. So an alternative form of thinking about climate change from the bottom up, from the grassroots. Exactly. So, uh, you know, mm. where you start with uh, indigenous knowledge, start with local coping and adaptation mechanisms that women are primarily leading through either their work in food or in the, ag in the agrarian sector, or even in water management and, and so on. So the bottom up uh, approaches have to be strengthened and uh, that's where civil society uh, partnerships are uh, primarily important. And I particularly, uh, uh, 
really love the uh, two sp uh, speakers, uh, you know, who are uh, much senior to me and brought out so well the hypocrisy of the West in terms of mm -hmm. historic emissions and uh, how the West has primarily been the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and they bear significant responsibility to the current state of climate change today and the continued fossil fuel, fuel sub cities that Western governments have continued to subsidize the fossil fuel industry. And there is a, uh, you know, and uh, today they are sitting on these positions of power and talking about technocratic fixes and systemic changes and carbon capture and so on. And uh, they're also known to export emissions, Western countries import goods and services from countries which have lower environmental regulations. And uh, these effects are very important and they get, uh, uh, you know, and we are today in the, uh, the global south who are, uh, you know, uh, the creation of the third world, those aspects or, uh, you know, the labeling surrounding our uh, systems and our knowledge. I uh, didn't have time to address it, but I'm so glad that it did get addressed. And uh, my response to uh, what Professor Shibli Kumar says, and I'm happy to be corrected if she has an alternate view, is to look at uh, bottom-up approaches and bring in uh, indigenous communities I had to lead the discussion on climate policy and maybe step aside if, if we have to. Thank you. Um, I think Shuli, Shuli is so lovely to see you after so many years. Lovely. I'm not seeing Same you, I'm here. just hearing you. Um, uh, it feels like a family. And it's just, it's so disappointing because I believe this was one of the knowledge partner. No, when do you knowledge partner on this G20? or some engagement group, I no, thought, no, and no. you are saying that you all not at least really. also did not know what was going on. But, you know, I've seen this is not just the problem with India hosting. I've seen this even when Germany hosted oh. many years ago. Each host country, they just control, the government controls this whole space. Uh, and the whole thing is so choreographed. Uh, that even though they talk about Jan Bhagedari and all that, all that is all handpicked and choreographed and it's not, nothing is left to, uh, you know, uh, last minute edition or that kind of a thing. And it is in G20, I know this is not today's topic, but I'm just saying that if G20 is becoming an important global policy space because UN is losing, unfortunately, it's uh, in uh, that kind of a role in global governance and in policy setting. And if G20 is emerging as that, then if you remember, like I don't know, I'm sure Vibhuti ji, you would recollect that how civil society in the 80s when the UN was also not accessible and how we all used to fight and like, you know, in then came that ECOSOC status. What if, even if it is difficult, you have to get that those passes and registration and get observer status and blah, blah. But at least there is a system for us to go online and register for, if I want to attend uh, COP28, I can go as a civil society register and attend COP28. Wow. There will be certain meetings which will be just for the government. But as wow. civil society, I can, maybe any one of us were able to attend G20 if we just wanted to go and register wow. and attend. That's not there. I think we need to raise this issue as a loud civil society voice that this is just not, an ex it's not acceptable. That this has to be a open, like, you know, okay, you do your government, whatever the delegation does, that also should be transparent. But as civil society, we should be allowed to participate in these policy spaces. But as uh, so beautifully, I think uh, Farida and Lavanya have shared, Julie, there are so many examples on the ground that where women-led development has, uh, you know, with using not uh, consultants from World Bank. And, you know, you remember when we were doing our research uh, in Pusar, it's all these World Bank consultant stories used to come forward, right? So, of course, there is all these, uh, you know, such beautiful examples when women's knowledge skills are recognized and women may be, uh, you know, economically poor, but th that doesn't mean they don't have knowledge and skills of how to actually frame the development agenda. And that is, so I feel that, uh, uh, you know, if we have not yet, like, I feel, uh, I know I'm going to get criticized because people hate this government so much and I might get seen as I'm supporting Modi. 
but that's not the case. But I feel in this G20, we have gotten a little bit of opportunity, which I should we should grab and really push and get these governments to do something about it. Because they have said certain things on paper. We should now take those things and make sure that they get tra actually translate into proper action plan and really deliver certain things that we would want. Because our like our government is really great on this. I'm talking about our wonderful Indian government. Uh, in projecting itself that it's actually listening to the global south, maybe they're doing better than what the North countries are doing. And so there is a language which is integrated in the G20, which does seem like it's coming from global south. And so these are things which I think we can, we should see it as an opportunity and really look at our strategy, how we push, okay, you said it in G20, it was your declaration, and what are you going to do about it? So that's my two cents. Yeah, thank you, Priti. Now, Radha Podel, do you, will you ask your question? Please unmute yourself. Ma'am, can we take two to three questions together? Yeah. Okay. But then they are of a different nature. We can't take them together. Okay. Radha Podel's question is very different. Radha, are you there? Hello. Uh, can you, Radha yeah. ji, can you unmute yourself? Okay, ma'am. Can we move we... to Pranav Achar ji? ji? Pranav ji, Saida ji, Ahana ji, Kiran ji. Yeah. Zulfi ji. Yes. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, ma'am, ma'am Pranav Acharya. Uh, actually, I want to know that I am hearing all your statesmen, uh, state um, statesmen, and I am eager to know that in this uh, um, title, feminist foreign policy, what uh, about the um, feminine of this um, poor departing? Uh, women's um, uh, women's um, features or role in uh, this imagination. Your, the question you have asked is that will mainstream allow feminist as a decision maker, whether it is climate change or a war situation like Ukraine? That's the, your question, no? Hello? No, that, that's a different question. Uh, the, okay. That was my first question. The first thing which you had asked, that was that you had asked, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Vibhuti ji, can you repeat? I'm not clear. I understood the question. The question was that will mainstream allow feminist as a decision maker, whether it is a climate change or a war situation like Ukraine? Mainstream. It means mainstream. M-A-L-E. Yeah, mainstream. Mainstream. Uh, not mainstream. Yeah, mainstream. Oh, I think the answer is very clear. Thank you, Devon. Now, if that was the case, I think nobody would uh, even talk about feminist foreign policy. There is foreign policy every country has. You know, even uh, in the developed countries, the need for having a feminist foreign policy because they saw this gender disparity, gender inequality, even in their own policies, um, you know, whatever policy they have for the other countries, maybe they were not concerned about it, but they, within themselves, they saw the disparity. So, um, I, the only thing we are concerned that if Sweden has a feminist foreign policy, does it, does that automatically make feminist for Bangladesh? So whether Swedish foreign policy becomes issues in countries, in other countries like Bangladesh. So that is kind of the thing that we are still asking. And also we are seeing that they are not uh, static, you know, so uh, one person starts the feminist foreign policy and other person stops it. So it's an ongoing process. And I think it's not, um, uh, the answer is that still, so, sorry to interrupt, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, ma'am. Ma 
Actually, what I'm saying is that that in uh, in relation uh, mm -hmm. foreign policy, feminism uh, presented ma ma mainstream as mainstream, mainstream as mainstream. They called mainstream as mainstream, and I am asking yeah, from that yeah. point of view. I am asking from that point of view that um, whether, uh, as one madam mentioned that. In a group of meeting, 5,029 uh, member female was available there out of uh, 5,000. Mm -hmm. On that ground, I want to know that uh, um, will they accept the female reason as a most vital point? Uh, I don't, you yeah, I don't think so yet because it's a process we have to. You know, this is why we just cannot just um, say by the increase in numbers of women participating, but who is participating and what perspective is being projected. So voice and even among, the, even, even among the feminists, you yeah. know, it has to be clear that which perspective is presented. Very important. Very important. Yeah. Now, Ahana Chaudhary, are you there? Mr. Zulfikar, hello. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Am I audible? Please introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, hello, ma'am. I am Hana Chaudhary, a research scholar from Tejpur University, Assam. So my question uh, is that, uh, first of all, uh, the presentations were very insightful and uh, enabled us to understand how to locate the like, feminist analysis in terms of uh, locating the binaries as well as diluting the binaries across the national and local governance systems and how climate change uh, creates sort of preferable space for the feminist uh, ideas and uh, to emerge in, uh, in process, to reflect in process. So my first question is that, um, I mean, whether the corporate social responsibility can also emerge as an idea when we talk about the understanding of feminist discourses within climate change and sustainability, because in, in the current stage of neoliberalism, I mean, there are a lot of companies and corporates who are also involved in the smart city projects and sort of engaging with the uh, women farmers also to sort of commercialize their products or, um, involve more fertilizers and better equipments within the farm nets while trying to bring in a certain kind of ethical sensibilities uh, along with economic responsibilities. So uh, whether the feminist analysis or the feminist way of looking at uh, issues of sustainability can find a more better space with corporate social responsibility. And uh, secondly, uh, Lavender Man specifically talked about the translation of uh, bureaucratic knowledge uh, in, from the larger structures to that of the community levels for the women to engage. So uh, if we talk about civil societies or the NGOs, how can we ensure that the translation of the knowledge uh, is taking place in a transparent manner? Because for instance, uh, I come from Assam, so uh, we have Zoom cultivations in many areas of the hills, but then it is also considered to be at the larger structure, it is also considered to be a misnomer. So how can we deal with the conflict in understandings of the local cultures in agriculture or farming? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, these are two of my questions. Thank you so much. I just want to touch upon this smart city project um, uh, because this is and in the name of um, climate change, they are bringing in GMOs and different kind of um, uh, technologies and making women do it. And so there is nothing feminist in it. It is actually corporate, uh, you know, action. And also, I think corporate social responsibility is a misnomer in terms of like, they are keeping their profit and, you know, like 
in Bangla, there is a, a saying, I don't know, in Hindi, it is there, Guru Mere Juta Da. You kill the cow and then give uh, a shoe, your know, leather shoe to us. So uh, that is kind of things corporate social responsibility is. So I don't see any feminist um, uh, thing in corporate socialism. And also we should not be naive in uh, that, um, you know, we are dealing with capitalism and, you know, patriarchy and capitalism. So it is a profit of the corporations and that we have to deal with, you know, that there is no question about it. Yeah, if I may come in. Yeah. So the corporate social responsibility, as uh, Farida Ji just said, nicely said, uh, only about uh, the 2% of the profits have to be set aside for reciprocity to the communities. That's the idea. But 98% of the profits are made by extracting from those communities uh, in a very uh, in, uh, in the capitalistic order, which is all about uh, scant respect for labor uh, regulations, minimum wages, scant respect for impacts on uh, the environment, you look at a mining industry or you look at a, a dam construction or any of these developmental projects run by corporates, the corporate government nexus is very difficult to beat uh, in terms of the money power and the muscle power. And uh, so as Nan rightly said, it is a misnomer because although 2% of profits is 98% of profits. Also mafia yeah, power, absolutely. Mafia, mafia, power. mafia power, there is uh, forms of power. It's very masculinist in nature and it is uh, undermines poor livelihoods and uh, uh, it's a very extractive relationship with the environment. So the 98% profit machinery is uh, through uh, uh, accumulation by dispossession of certain groups, okay. continuous uh, accumulation by disposition. So uh, that was, uh, that's my uh, two cents. So uh, Vibhuti ji, I just wanted to share something which, uh, you know, I was greatly inspired by. Uh, you know, maybe a year or a year and a half ago, I attended a conference which was on, in. Indian Farmers Conference and there were farmers from all over India that was held in Bangalore and uh, I grew up in Bombay so I understand Marathi so I found some farmers particularly there was a group which came from Maharashtra Vidharbha area which is for others who are not from India to know this is the drought prone and this is where the farmers suicide incidents were very uh, extensive and very uh, like you know uh, uh, horrible case studies and things have emerged from there. So there was a group of maybe uh, around 40-50 farmers from Vidharba had come and I was sitting with the women farmers. There were about 20 women farmers in that group. So I was sitting with them and because I could talk in Marathi I could in, uh, have a conversation with them. And so I would just start to chit chat like how did you all come? How many of you have come? And what and uh, so they shared that they came for the first time, they came by a flight. They took a plane to come from Vidharba to, that must be from Nagpur to Bangalore, they took a flight. So I thought, oh, that is great that the organizer, I just assumed. So I said, uh, you know, it was, it was great that the organizers funded your, your flight, you could come. So they said, no, they did not. They said, I said, then who paid? we paid so there was such a pride in saying i said what how did this like what happened so then they told me the story they said the we were in such bad situation because the rivers in our region had dried up and uh, uh, you know we could not even we used to get three crops we could not even get one crop because even if there was a monsoon the water would just go away and the rivers would not have any but then uh, uh, an NGO along with government partnership and they brought some corporate money. I know I've, it, it did have corporate money. What they did was they empowered the local women's collective to take care of the rivers. But it was not just the desilting or building uh, dams on the river, but it was looking at river as a whole ecosystem. And it was all done by local women's knowledge. 
of how to take care of rivers, like where you need to plant trees, where the water flow is, where the cash flow is, how to maximize that the water, maximum water, rainwater collects in the river. It reached that the groundwater level increased by, I don't know how many meters. And now they can again get three crops and so they were poor farmers. They were such in such poverty. And just by taking care of their rivers by local women's knowledge, and the government gave them NREGA money, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act money to do this work. And they were able to totally transform their life. So it's such a, like, you know, so things can work also if women are at the center of development. And to recognize that they have skill and knowledge and they can totally yeah. take care of it. No, but this happened mm. only after union. They got, became uh, organized. Makam under the leadership correct, of correct. my Khan Adhikar Manj. True. And they came Absolutely. up, they, they, yeah. uh, the representation mm. voice, researches, evidence-based uh, recommendations given by Makam resulted in the local level policy changes. No, So I think that is very, that's the moral of the story that uh, uh, they, they were collective and which they made and they use the collective yes. wisdom so that is very important yeah it's a very um, yeah very encouraging example no, we need positive stories also like not so yeah, navadhanya seed savers uh, dda's uh, efforts in karnataka drought prone area all of them are yeah. very very uh, alternatives they have shown the local mm -hmm. alternatives yes yeah mm -hmm. so now we have uh, I think, Mr. Zulfikar, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. I think that has been discussed. Yeah. These two questions have been already discussed. I think he's not in the meeting. Oh, ma'am, I don't think he's in the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think... I think there was also a question by Shailendra Gorji. Would you she like said that uh, it is not there because it is just, she said, what would be the best example to go through to understand exact value-based message of, of this think talk? So that, that. Yeah. So now can we go for the final round? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, um, all three speakers, panelists, please. What would be your last word and... What is the path ahead? What are the future action plan that people can, because there are social activists, there are researchers, there are scientists, there are uh, uh, women activists. So what will really is your message? Yeah. Way ahead. Uh, Ma'am, do I have permission to speak, please? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, Ma Shalendra Gaur is my name, and I'm working with Public Works Department Building and Roads, Government of Haryana. I'm working there as assistant engineer. Yeah. Uh, I ask you this question, like, for me, there are certain examples where the entire success and the entire setup and the entire program, even if you take example of ISRO or DRDO or some engineering research projects, the entire program that was a sure, sure success because of the women empowerment and the knowledge bank they all have. Even uh, I'm a researcher also, and in my research, I have met uh, three uh, doctorate researchers and of course they are women and they have they have helped me a lot actually what message actually we need to understand to make it as a primary factor to grow in a society as a part and as a must factor that's this what exactly I want to know. Ma'am, would you like to answer? Yeah. 
response from you. Hello. Yes, ma'am, please. You, you are asking me or the panelists? Any, and anyone, ma'am, anyone, anyone. Because for me, you all are uh, one of those great persons who have knowledge. I'm just a beginner. A similar experience of Maharashtra PWD, where they are constructing 1,200 kilometers of road, passing six districts. I think there also uh, it is supported by Asian Development Bank. And uh, there the gender component is very, very strong. And I think all the decision makers in this whole project, right from the uh, head uh, environmental engineer to uh, 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 a finance person or uh, also the scientists, all of them are women. And I think they have brought in so many experiences of other Asian countries. How can gender be, in, uh, how the whole project can be engendered. And first the response of PWD was that we are constructing road. What do we have to do with gender? No, that was the approach. And when they started giving examples of uh, how it is not only just road construction is not a just a gender neutral activity. It connects the villages with the uh, main road, bus start, it's bus start stopping, educate, enrollment of women, uh, and ch uh, children increases, it ensures safety, economic activities expand. You need to have a, the toilets on the road so that, uh, 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 and this toilet should not be only for men uh, 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 it, and gender neutral toilet, but there should be specific toilet for children, person with disability. So I think slowly and gradually they opened up because when the concrete examples were given. So I think it's very important that this kind of dialogues where multi-sectoral dialogues where scientific community, engineers, technocrats, uh, women's studies scholars, and the uh, uh, action groups at a grassroots, no? they uh, interact with each other and come out with the collective wisdom. That's very important because it is inclusive, not only of uh, women, but it's inclusive of children, elderly, persons with disability, people from the marginalized section, all of them get included in the process. It's not, a, resources are there, but how wisely to use resources and how to make it inclusive is very important. Like in city, like Bombay, we have 2,300 toilets for men, but there are hardly 112 toilets for women. They are also never clean. There are no doors. They are this. It's basically the gender blindness of the authorities. It's not the sanitation budget of Bombay. is 40% of total budget of Bombay uh, Municipal Corporation is for sanitation. And imagine Bombay Municipal Corporation is the wealthiest corporation in whole of Asia. And still the, there is a gender blind. And then the campaign started where 40 NGOs with young women activists, they started uh, uh, this whole right to pee campaign. So I think, and then the, the system started responding. No? So there are many such local level experiences that, which we need to amplify their voice and uh, also uh, empower them. But, but uh, ma'am, basically, the presentation, uh, but also their voices has to be heard. Yeah. But uh, uh, ma'am, there is one simple hurdle. What I could understand. And that hurdle is the early primary education sector. This is my that personal is experience yeah. in, in a rural area, because most of us people, they are from rural area. Even I'm from a village. So yeah. one simple thing is there that we are not giving a vision to the woman section or girl child. We are basically giving a as a whole new vision, only as a societal part. Yeah. This is something what I experience. I might be wrong. Yeah. But, but now at, at primary, yeah. now primary B, at elementary education, at primary education, even till uh, up to 10 plus 2 level, girl child is not having that vision. And for to support that vision, I think there is no such program. When we you yeah, and I think that, you, I, uh, that is the effort, no, of the women's groups and all the three speakers they talked about that also, no, local level initiative. So we are starting now. You have also understood it. So you become our ambassador, and in your area, you started. <laughs> Whenever you need support, we will be with you. Yeah, so but I, I, that is, uh, 
in yeah. Bangladesh, you know, I, I just want to share that in Bangladesh, there have been many, many me mega projects, like including the Padma Bridge and, um, you know, Metro Rails and all these things. But they have really, uh, you know, disregarded women's needs and also displaced uh, many women and households where women are the most affected and women's voices are not heard. So this is one of the issues that we are now, you know, protesting against, you know, that for the mega projects, it can, it may look very nice, but in the, behind the scene, women are suffering. Uh, Ma'am, can I add one sentence if you allow, if time, is, uh, time allows? We have exceeded time limit by 15 minutes. I think you can um, directly discuss with I can, all of I'm that. coming directly to the point, ma'am. Until or unless we doesn't follow our Vedic science system, which says, because our, uh, in our domestic life, if we see our old traditions, every process that includes a particular kind of science. Yeah. And that is being forgotten and never been taught in school level even. If that thing happens, then the girl child will have exposure to the scientific world. This is my suggestion. If somebody, uh, if your platform can forward this uh, suggestion to anywhere, whichever place uh, you, are, you can. But even after getting exposure, she should have a power to speak, a platform, a voice, and representation. That is most. Ma'am, you are there. Yeah. Ma'am, yeah. like okay. you are there, then you have to make your place in this world. Even that is true for every man also. If yeah. you cannot speak at a uh, for uh, while coming forefront, you you no one will listen you. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Understood. Okay. So thank can you, we now conclude the session? Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So, Thanks for much. First of all, I would like to thank all three panelists for an extremely erudite and mind boggling so many mind boggling issues that they covered in their erudite presentations. Uh, there, uh, this is a very, very important and challenging and highly complex issue the question of uh, climate change concerns in Asia and Pacific region, because Asia is the region most vulnerable to climate change, and India is ranked as one of the most climatic vulnerable countries in the world, uh, frequently affected by natural disasters. Top-down policies or, and technocratic solution we show, so uh, the, the, our uh, panelists also gave us example that uh, how they are cre creating uh, disasters and they are uh, exhausted exacerbating disasters, uh, lowering the environmental norms. It is not only in uh, South Asia, I think all over Asia, uh, the, the uh, nations after nations are lowering the environmental norms, which is resulting in varied forms of climatic crisis. Uh, the conspicuous effect of climate change can be perceived in the form of natural disaster, degradation of environment that are striking to the eyes, but indirect cascading effect due to human-induced disasters is debated, but goes unscrutinized. I think all three, I think both, especially Farida ji and Lavanya ji highlighted that. And because of women's unequal participation in decision-making processes, that sustains due to failure to make structural changes. Climate change has further exacerbated the food crisis uh, with loss of food production, loss of food access, impacting children, elderly, particularly pregnant women due to malnutrition. An intergovernmental panel on climate change, what is known as a IPCC, the sixth assessment report highlights that future exposure to climatic hazards is also increasing globally due to socioeconomic and development trends, including migration, growing inequality, urbanization, consumerist and hedonistic lifestyle that was very powerfully uh, projected by the PowerPoint presentation of Lavanya Ji. Uh, intergovernmental panel also noted that rural women in the developing countries are among the groups most vulnerable to climate change and I think Farida ji gave so many examples of uh, Bangladesh and also the work which the uh, eco-feminist uh, uh, like Dr. Vanna Shiva uh, and we do women and uh, environment uh, organization is doing. The gender differential impact of climate change in terms of storms and sandstorms, rot and ultimately uh, untimely rain, untimely snowfall, melting of glaciers, uh, forest fires, typhoons, deluge and floods are violent that demand 
interventions in climate generated to be conducted in a gender aware manner and efforts of relief and rehabilitation must be have a gender responsiveness i think we, we all know uh, the what happened at the time of tsunami or the earthquake in latu or the, the 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 cyclones that that were that the, that happened during the pandemic climate change disasters uh, generate instability insecurity homelessness dislocation loss of life uh, like support resulting in a multifaceted gender-based violence affecting livelihoods and biodiversity through heat drought as water levels rise and require other strategies so for food security on this planet farmers especially in drought prone regions need to be encouraged supported to adopt cost effective and location specific climate resilience technologies that came out even in the discussion that why we need to respect the local knowledge which uh, uh, communities have inherited over generations we need to understand as the renowned literature krishna sabati states and i quote whoever the homeland may belong to it is not merely a piece of geography it is also not just history nor is it the rivers of the region or the mountains it is all those things that keep getting absorbed in very being whether you want it or not and hence the when we talk about the feminist foreign policy whether you use that term or you call it a gender equality policy gender responsive policy for climate change in asia and pacific we need to direct our attention uh, to the socio economic transformation required for climate mitigation management the uh, manage the negative consequences of climate mitigation on vulnerable populations and enable just transition towards low emission development and ensure sustainable development thank you for such an enriched discussion and so many learnings and so many takeaways we have from this panel discussion please be prepared for tomorrow tomorrow the focus will be on peace again we will have a extremely renowned and very um, experienced panelist who have worked at a ground level uh in the asian countries thank you thank you ma'am with the chair's permission thank can you. we move yeah. to the vote of thanks yeah please as we come to the end of day 1 of feminist foreign policy in the asia pacific region an online international workshop program a two day immersive online discussion workshop i harsha kwatra researcher at impri impact and policy research institute would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of impri new delhi we are grateful to our experts for the day one session ms farida akhtar ms lavanya shanbhog arvind and ms preeti taruka for taking out their valuable time and giving us an opportunity to learn from this program we thank our chair professor vibhuti patel ma'am for her insights we thank all of our participants who have raised questions and actively participated in today's deliberation we would also like to thank all of you for gracing our book launch of advocating feminist foreign policy for india the book is absolutely free hope you guys give it a read we look forward to welcoming you tomorrow that is 20th september 2023 for our second day of this program by distinguished experts ms irina santiago dr wahida nainar dr atika nur alami on the theme feminist foreign policy in the asia pacific region for transactional solidarity for peace we are grateful if you are watching us later on youtube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications we hope you continue to join in future to our impri web policy talk and web policy learning wishing you a good day thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you.